service this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your call to worship this morning is from Psalm chapter 33. It says this, Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from one generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. And with that, I'll invite you to stand as we sing our opening hymn this morning, hymn number 181 in the blue hymnal, O Four Thousand Tongues to Sing, hymn number 181 in the blue hymnal. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed, whereupon we come for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake, Grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, that by your grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us, and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us of all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he gives a power to become the sons of God, and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. You may be seated.
today's first lesson is Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 through 22, and that can be found on page 290 of the Pew Bible. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them, and he chose you, their descendants, above all nations, as as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not stiffen, not, do not be stiff-necked any longer, for the Lord your God is God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the alien giving him food and clothing. And you are to love those who are aliens, for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God, serve him, hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. He is your praise, he is your God, who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you have saw with your own eyes. Your forefathers who went into Egypt were 70 in all, and now the Lord your God has made, them, made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. Here is the first lesson. The second lesson is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 9, and that can be found on 1772 in the Pew Bible. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge. Because of our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you, therefore you do not lack spiritual gifts as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ our Lord is faithful. Here ends the second lesson. Gospel reading for this morning can be found on page 1535 in your pew Bibles. It's Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 46. Again, that can be found on page 1535, Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 46. I'll invite you to stand out of respect for the gospel if you're able to. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 34. Reading in Jesus' name. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one can say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Here ends the gospel reading this morning. Praise be to thee, O Christ. 
you join with me in confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed? That can be found on page 32 in your blue hymnals. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our next hymn this morning is hymn number 171 in the blue hymnal. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Hymn number 171 in the blue hymnal. Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, and Charles M. Schwab. What comes to your mind when you think of these names? Maybe a little bit of money, right? They're all known for being wealthy. Rockefeller gained his wealth from oil, Carnegie for his work with steel, and Charles M. Schwab for taking over as president of the Carnegie Steel Company at a ripe old age of 35 years. Have you ever heard of Ivy Lee, though? Most people probably haven't. 
Ivy Lee was a consultant recommended by Rockefeller to Schwab as he was overwhelmed with the amount of tasks at hand with taking over this company. The amount of things that needed to get done were overwhelming. And so Rockefeller came beside him and said, I've got this consultant that could help you out. Lee offered his services for no charge. At the end of a 30-day trial, he said Schwab could pay him what he thought his advice was worth. So the two met together. Lee told Schwab to compile a list of the six most important things that need to be, get done the next day to further the overall health of U.S. Steel. And whatever he didn't finish on that day, that next day, would go to the top of the list for the day after. And then he would have six, a list of six things to get done. The meeting lasted all of 15 minutes. 15 minutes and that was it. But the results for Schwab and for the steel company were far more significant. Worth a, a check at that point, $25,000, which back in the day, that was, I mean, still quite a bit, but back in the day, it went a lot further than it does today. But that was it. That was all his advice was. Find the six most important things and do these six things. And if you don't get it done, then get it done tomorrow. Having a laser-focused approach helps organizations to succeed. It gives them a helpful criteria to determine where to invest their limited time and resources for the benefit of the organization. Now, to do that takes a lot of work, and it's a bit of a challenge to make that done. And, and in our lives as Christians, if we want to succeed in our lives as Christians, we ask ourselves the same question. What's the most important thing for me to do as a Christian to succeed? If we look at our lives, we see ourselves being pulled in many different directions again and again. Many different things are sold to us as the most important thing for you this moment. And there's so many good things that distract us. And to be fair, there are also so many minor things that distract us as well. When it comes to the Christian life, what is the most important thing? In our text this morning, Jesus points us to that thing. I invite you again to open your Bibles to Matthew 22, verses 34 through 46, as I read our, our sermon text again. And if you're able to stand, again, in respect for God's word, I'll invite you to stand. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 46. Reading in Jesus' name. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. And while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David. He said to them, Then how does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. Father God, these are your words and your word is true. We pray this morning that you would sanctify us in your truth here today. Father, we pray that you would draw our attention to your son, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It's just another normal day for Jesus. He's in the temple and he's trying to teach people about the kingdom of God. And immediately as he enters into the temple, he is confronted and asked and interrogated. And, and the people come to him and ask this question. Who gave you authority to be here and to teach? Think about that for a second. They're asking Jesus in the temple... Who gave you the authority to be here and to teach? In other words, you don't belong here. That's happening in, in Matthew chapter 21, and 21 and 22 are happening on the same day here. But these Pharisees, towards the end of chapter 22, are, are coming and continuing that line of thought, saying, Jesus, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. And they continue, group after group, continues to ask Jesus questions to prove that he doesn't belong. So these Pharisees aren't asking Jesus a question in order to learn something new. The events from earlier that day include the Pharisees trying to lure Jesus into a fatal trap, 
saying, Jesus, who do we pay taxes to? And Jesus says, well, give me a, a coin whose inscription is it. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to the Lord the things that are the Lord's. But they asked that question trying to trip him in front of other people to say, oh, you don't care about our country. Let's kill him. Or, oh, you don't serve the Roman Empire like you're supposed to. Let's have the Romans kill him. They're asking Jesus question after question. And each time, Jesus answers and gets, out, gets off scot-free. The next question is brought to him by a group of people who don't believe in any such thing like the resurrection. In their minds, it doesn't happen. It's never going to happen. It can't happen. And so these people come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, I've got a question for you. So if someone is, if a man is married to a lady and that man dies and the man has six other brothers and like, he's, like this lady is supposed to do or the brother is supposed to do, marries his, his sister-in-law to continue that family line and then he dies before there are any kids and then the next son dies or next brother dies and the next one and the next one, then, then Jesus in the resurrection, can you tell me whose, whose husband she belongs to? It's a nonsense question. Because they don't even believe in the resurrection. But they're just asking these questions of Jesus to kick up dust uh, to get him in trouble. This is the background of, of what's happening here. And so Jesus is asked this question, which law, Lord, is the most important law for us to follow? The Pharisees had 613 laws to follow. 613 things, not six. 613 things that they had to be sure to do if they were going to be a good law-abiding Pharisee. The question begins with the presupposition that's false. It begins with the notion that God's laws have varying degrees of importance. The 613 laws the Pharisees had did have varying degrees, and if you were in a bind, you did one over the other. But God's laws aren't like that. His law remains steadfast. The question is asked to determine which is the most important law. And Jesus answers in verse 37. He says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. In other words, the most important commandment of God is that we are rightly related to God himself, and that we love him with all of our being. And as, or as we learn in our confirmation class, that, that we fear and love him before all things. It's to emanate from our hearts, from our being, to, core, to pour out from the core of our souls. It's to be the thought in our mind that is constantly on our minds that we are always obsessing about. It's an all-encompassing love for God that consumes our whole being. That's the requirement of the law. And this is the most important law that Jesus is telling the Pharisees here to keep. But it wasn't, if that wasn't impossible enough, Jesus wastes no time and he goes immediately into the second one. And he says this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you thought it was good enough to just love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, strength, and, and all of your being, if you think that you're doing that, okay, here's the next one. Love your neighbor as yourself. And these two go together. Neighbors are a wonderful gift, aren't they? How many of you here have neighbors that you can rely on to cut your yard if you're going to be gone for a little while, or to watch your mail, to get your mail, to water your plants, to give you a stick of butter when you run out, or to do chores for you when you're gone? Most of us do, don't we? It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a next-door neighbor. Maybe that neighbor is next door. Those neighbors are easy for us to love because they offer you something in return. It's a give-and-take relationship. But Jesus expands this idea of neighbor to not just be the ones who can offer you something or can do some favor for you. He doesn't limit it to the ones who just live closest to us either. But Jesus goes so far as to say our neighbors include even our enemies. At an earlier time in Jesus' life, a lawyer approached Jesus to find out again, God, what must I do? Or Jesus, good teacher, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, keep the law. And he says, I've done all these things. He says, okay, uh, well, well, or you love your neighbor as yourself. He says, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus goes into the story of the Good Samaritan. He doesn't answer his question and say, uh, the, the people three blocks away from you, those are your neighbors, just love them and everything's going to be okay. And Jesus tells him a story that's a hard pill to swallow. The good Samaritan is the, the enemy who serves his enemy. That is what a neighbor is. How many of us can say that we've always loved those that we've come in contact with? 
the ones we get along with and the ones that we don't always get along with. And that doesn't mean doing whatever it is that they want you to do, but to genuinely act in their best interest. Even if that means having difficult conversations. Even if that means doing things that we just plain old don't want to do today, like speaking the truth in love. It's way more fun speaking the truth in a way that I can say, I'm better than you because I know this, and you really should know this. That's more fun, isn't it? Uh, or am I the only one that thinks that's a, that's a more fun way to do that? It's fun to elevate ourselves over others. Or it's also more fun to avoid potentially uncomfortable situations. And so rather than speaking the truth in love, we refuse to speak the truth at all. We maybe speak a lie, or we just drop it and go on to other things. But Jesus ties these two commandments together in verse 40, stating that on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. The rules and regulations in the Old Testament can all be summarized into these two simple statements. We talk about the two tables of the law. The, the first is how we relate to God, and that is important, that is necessary. But also important and necessary is how we relate to one another. And these things are simple, really. There's Ten Commandments. There's ten of them for us. They're simple, but they're not easy, are they? These laws are easy for us to understand, but they continue to point out our failures again and again. And we get consumed with other things rather than consumed with love for God. We're consumed with love for self, and we act in our own self-interest. And there are often more pressing matters in our lives in this moment than loving God. We tell ourselves, since he's always going to be there, I'll get to that tomorrow. Or after I get these other 15 things that need to get done, then, then since God's always going to be there, I'll, I'll get to that later. I, but I promise you, Lord, I'll get there. We distract ourselves. And then when it comes to loving our neighbors, we're up for it. If they're the neighbors that we like, we appreciate, or the neighbors that can offer us something in return, or if it's a way that we can love them in a way that, that we want to love them. I mean, when we pick our own terms, it's easy for us to do that. And these two commandments are meant to be together. Naturally, when we talk about fulfilling the law, our minds immediately think of, okay, what must I do? I have to do something as though it's only an action that needs to be done. However, the law is demanding here far more than just an action. But it demands a love, a genuine love and concern for others, a genuine love and concern for the Lord. One commentator referred to this love as a love of understanding and corresponding purpose. How many of us, when we have someone that, that we don't agree with, have that love to seek to understand where they're coming from? Or do we just say, you're wrong, writing you off, and I'm going to do my own thing? This is this love of God that he's telling us to have towards our neighbor. A love of understanding and, and purpose. And that's exactly what God does for us. God gives to us this kind of love. He shows this kind of love toward us, and he demands this kind of love toward himself and toward our neighbor, regardless of who that neighbor is, whether he's a stranger to us or a man that's filled with enmity toward us. We also noted that we lack, that we by nature lack the love demanded by these commandments. Do these laws bring any conviction to your heart? Are we measuring up to them? We say that we are fulfilling these things. Maybe you're feeling a bit overwhelmed today. How are we to keep all of these commandments at all times? How are we to love the Lord, those that the Lord has placed in our path? And, and not just with affection and, and warm fuzzies, but in word and in deed. Again and again and again. We fail. We can't do it. No matter how hard we try, no matter how determined we are, we all fall short here. We can't even keep these two parts of the law. So what hope can there be? This love comes from a place outside of ourselves. We love because God first loved us, the scripture says. And this is where Jesus points us back to the main thing here in this text. He answers the Pharisees' question. And as the Pharisees are putting their heads together one more time to try to stump Jesus, to find another trap that they can get rid of this man and call for his death, Jesus gets to the most important issue here in the text. After summarizing the law simply and perfectly in two easy statements intended to bring these Pharisees to the end of themselves, Jesus asks them about the Messiah. Who is a Messiah? 
This is the question that had been nagging on the Pharisees the last three years. Who is this Messiah? Is Christ the Messiah? By what power does he do all of these signs and wonders? How can he be doing these things? He is just a man. And at the end of the day, the biggest issue boils down to this one pivotal issue. Who is the Messiah? Who is the Savior? The Pharisees had an idea of who the Savior was, as well as any other Jew would have known that the Messiah would be a son of David. It's a title that had been used for Jesus before. And if you look at the book of Matthew and the book of Luke, at the very beginning, you see a couple of lineages. And each one of those lineages traces Jesus' lineage back to David, saying that Jesus is this son of David. Even the blind beggar Bartimaeus, who has no sight, who can't see things, calls out to Jesus. And what does he call Jesus? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This blind man is able to perceive that this son, this David's son, this this sonship is far more significant than just a bloodline. Because just any other son of David or descendant of David couldn't restore the sight to the blind. But the Messiah could. Bartimaeus implored Jesus, the son of David, to have mercy on him. And Jesus did. And he was given his sight. and, And he was told, your faith has made you well. He knew who Jesus was. Jesus is the son of David, but he's more than just a mere man. He is the Messiah. Again, the irony that this blind man could see more clearly than the religious rulers and leaders of the day, the ones who are standing face to face with this son of David right now, who has answered masterfully all of their questions. But Jesus doesn't give up on them. He presses them further, recounting the words of David from Psalm 110 saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David calls this descendant of his, this future son of David, he calls him Lord, recognizing that he is far greater than King David himself was, recognizing that God had promised to crush David's Lord's enemies. And then Jesus asks the next logical question. How can David call this Messiah Lord if he's only David's son? Son meaning descendant here. Not necessarily the immediate heir to the throne, but eventual descendant. And the Pharisees are speechless. They don't know how to answer the question. How could they answer the question without incriminating themselves? How could they honestly answer the question without affirming their willful rejection of this very man standing before them? This son of David, this Messiah. who's not just a mere man, not a mere son of David, but is also the son of God making Christ far greater than David ever was? How could they save face while also pleading ignorance when the cold, hard truth stared them in the face? And in a callous coldness, they walked away, still clinging firmly to their disbelief that Christ was not the Son of God. He couldn't be. There's no way. Impossible. And here, standing before their eyes, was the love of God on display for them. God willing to send his son for these calloused people who continued to reject his Savior, continued to reject this wonderful, precious gift. And they refused to acknowledge him. The events of ha- what's happening here in Matthew chapter 22 are happening on a Tuesday, a Tuesday of Holy Week. Jesus has entered into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, proclaiming that he is the promised Messiah in that triumphal entry to Jerusalem, fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy, identifying that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the son of David, but he is also the son of God sent to save them. And here he is asking these people, who am I? They have no answer. Pharisees were tired of Jesus and looking for a way to have him killed, which, again, would only ironically place the love of God on display in a more explicit way. Thankfully, this Jesus, the son of David and son of man and son of God, didn't give up on them, didn't give up on us either. In order to give up on following the law in all of its fullness, Jesus was the only person who loved the Lord his God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his mind. And he did it by loving his neighbor as himself. When it would have been easy for Jesus to turn those simple stones into bread, he had the power to do that. He was hungry. 
He hadn't eaten for 40 days, and yet he refused. Why? Because he put your needs before his own. When he was offered the glory of the earth, apart from the crucifixion and the trial that would come with that, he selflessly puts that glory aside to endure the shame, the humiliation, and the pain, and the agony of the cross. Again, why? Not for any glory for himself, but for your sake and for mine. When he could have left this earth at any time to go back to the comforts and the familiarity of, of home, of his, earth, of his heavenly throne, to be with his Father again. Jesus prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done. He loved us more than he loved his own life. And in doing so, he obeyed the Father's will, and he feared and loved his Father before all things. He loved God perfectly. And when Jesus could have just called down lightning on these Pharisees, he knew what they were doing. These Pharisees, intent on trying to discredit and discard Jesus, he lovingly asks them the question they spent so much time refuting in their minds giving them another chance. Guys, I know that you're trying to kill me. Do you know who I am? Do you know why I'm here? I'm here to save you. I'm here to save you from your attitude right now that you want to kill me. I'm here to save you from the actions that I know you're going to put me through in just a few more days, and I am here and I'm not going away. Who am I? Am I the Son of God? Am I not the promised Messiah? He could have called off that crucifixion at any point. But instead, he cries out to his father and says, It is finished. The Pharisees' hope, the Pharisees' savior, is standing right in front of them. The man that they were trying to discard was the Messiah who had come to save. And the Savior comes for you today as well, standing before you in all of his holiness and all of his righteousness, saying, Here, I have kept this for you. You can't love the Lord your God with all your strength, with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your mind, but I have for you. You can't love your neighbor as yourself, but I have in your place and in your stead. Don't let yourself be so caught up in chasing after the most important thing in, in this life that we neglect to see God's love and provision for you in Christ. That Christ has come to be your Messiah. That Christ has come to be your substitute. That Christ has not only come to be these things, but also to be your righteousness. That Christ has come to live inside of you as well so that you can love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So that you can love your neighbor as yourself. Christ has come to show us the Father's love so that we can love as Christ has loved us. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and for its truth. God, we thank you that you weren't content to just set all the things in motion here on this earth and sit back and, and watch us destroy ourselves. But God, you entered into time and space and eternity, being born of a man or born of a woman, becoming a son of man, Jesus, you took on flesh to live among us, to be a perfect substitute for us. And not only to be that perfect substitute, but, but Christ to call us back to yourself as well. That we would see the love of the Father for us. Jesus, as we look at your law, we look at your word, we see that, that we do not measure up. We also see in your word the promises of what you have done and accomplished for us in our place and in our stead. So that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God, we thank you for that. And we trust in that promise and that hope today. And Father, we pray that you would teach us to love our neighbors as ourself, that we would continue to show the love that you have given us, that that love would pour out within our own souls, and the love for you and the love for others. Lord, that more people would know who you are, who you truly are, that you are the Messiah. You are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lord, you are the Lamb of God who has taken away my sin. You've taken away the sin of my neighbors too. We praise you for that. We thank you for that. Father, we pray that you would use us to continue to draw more people to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we'll take our offering here this morning. Uh, reminder, our Sunday school offering is going to our missionaries of the month, Andrew and Alexis Olson. 
And that's in the basket in the back. And at this time, we'll take our church offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you would give us this day our daily bread. We thank and praise you that you give daily bread to all men, even to the wicked, without our prayer. We pray that you would lead us to acknowledge our daily bread as your gift and to receive it with thanksgiving. We pray for all that is required to satisfy our bodily needs here on this earth, such as food and clothing, house and home, fields and flocks, money and goods, pious parents, children and servants, and godly and faithful rulers. For good government, seasonable weather, peace and health, order and honor, true friends, good neighbors, and the like. Thank you, God, that you give us each of these good gifts, that they come from your hand. We pray now, Lord, that as we give back to you a portion of what you've blessed us with and entrusted into our care, that you would use these gifts to further your kingdom here among us. We pray also, Lord, for those in our bulletins who are listed with various health concerns, for Lauren, Donovan, Connie, Alan, Dave, Judy, Annie, Kim, Jan, Karen, for Sage, for Deb. Father, we pray for all of those who are going through cancer as well, that you would work in their hearts and in their lives, Lord, that you would rid their bodies of this cancer, and Father, that you would be bringing uh, salvation to each one of these people, Lord, each pe person in our sphere of influence as well. Father, we pray for all those who are with child. Think of Lachey and Cassidy. Thank you for this new life, God. We pray as the due dates have come and as they approach, Father, we pray for safe deliveries. We also pray, Lord, that these children would grow up to love and serve you all the days of their lives. We pray, Father, for all of those who are in crisis pregnancies, that you'd be with them, draw near to them and support them. Lord, help them to know your love for them as well. For those who are suffering from miscarriage, Lord, help them to know that you are the God who grieves alongside them and, and mourns with them. Help them to find comfort in you. Lord, for all of those who are waiting for adoption, we pray for adoption, Father. We also pray for those who are waiting to be adopted. Lord, that you would reveal yourself to be the one who gives families to those without families. Thank you, God, that you are a father to the fatherless. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to see that you are who you are and that you are doing those things even now. Father, we pray that you would be with the residents of our nursing homes and assisted living. Think of Edna for Helen, Marjorie. Lord, watch over these ladies. We pray that you would draw them closer to yourself and be with all the other residents as well and for the staff too. Strengthen and encourage them today. Be with the students in our congregation, Lord, for Jenna, CJ, Samuel, Brendan, Evan, Judith, myself. God, we pray that you would continue to form and fashion us after your own image and grow us into the people that you are calling us to be, to the servants, Lord, that you're calling us to be as well. We pray, Lord, that you be with those who are serving in the military. Think of Aaron and Andrew. Lord, for all of those who are deployed at home or abroad, we pray that you'd be with them. Watch over them and protect them. Father, we pray for peace as well. We pray, Lord, that you would be with our veterans too. We thank you for them. We pray that you'd provide for them. Lord, we pray that you'd be with our country for our leaders. God, we pray for wisdom. Not a wisdom that the earth provides, Lord, but a wisdom that comes from you. Father, that they would first and foremost see who they are in reality and in relationship to you. 
and that they would come and submit to you and, and to your will and your ruling and, and leading. Father, we pray that they would be saved. We pray that you'd be with our police. We thank you for uh, police that do their job justly. And, and Lord, for those who don't, we pray that you would be with them, that you would bring conviction to their hearts, that they would be able to provide protection as they have sworn to do. We pray for our communities, Lord, that you continue to spare us from all harm and danger. And we thank you, Lord, that you have done that here in our communities. We pray for those, Father, who aren't able to have, uh, or who are being affected by various tragedies around the world, whether fires or droughts or floods, uh, tornadoes, hurricanes. Lord, we pray that you would comfort them, that you would provide for them, that you would raise up your church to provide for their needs as well. We pray, Lord, that you would send revival here in, in our midst too. We pray that you'd be with our association retreat center in Wisconsin and for the staff running those. Father, thank you for your provision, for your leading of that place. We pray for the ministry that's being done there as well. Lord, that you would further your kingdom through that retreat center. We pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. We think especially of uh, the Chinese church and the Twin Cities. Father, we thank you for that ministry. We pray for every soul that comes through that congregation, Lord, and goes back to China, that you would strengthen them and encourage them and draw near to them. Lord, we pray that you'd be with our seminary interns as well, that you would raise up more men to, to fill the empty pulpits, God, that you would call people to train for the work of, of ministry. But Lord, that you would work in our hearts as well, continue to draw us into maturity in our faith and, and draw us closer to you. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with our missionary of the month for Andrew and Alexis Olson and for their, their daughters, Mariah, Selah, and Eliana. Lord, we also thank you and praise you for the New Testament that they've been translating in Kareewe. Thank you that it's nearing completion. Father, we pray that your word would go forth and that you would save sinners and bring them into your flock. Lord, that you would save them and forgive them as well. Lord, we pray now that you'd be with us and, and hear us as we pray together the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we leave today thinking of the goodness of God and his grace and mercy toward us in providing for us a Savior and Messiah, let's join together and sing our closing hymn, hymn number 559. And great is thy faithfulness, hymn number 559.